yeah, thanks for staying for the keynote speech. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so uh, this was an idea I kind of had uh, last, uh, last fall. I put it in, wrote some notes on it, never really turned it into much of a talk because it initially wasn't accepted, but uh, kind of gone through my notes and put together a bunch of stuff. I hope that it uh, goes pretty well. Um, over the last few years, like, well, I, probably the last like five or six years, I've hired quite a few people from uh, well, Dev Point and Bottega and Dev Mountain. And I've seen some of them just do a fantastic job of uh, stepping up and just being really good at at least a few things. Like, and sometimes I've just walked in and been blown away like, wow, you did that one thing way faster than I could have done that. Or in some cases, like, I would have had to Google that or <laughs> whatever, you know, and like, they apparently just knew it. And I mean, not to say like, you know, like with three months of experience, someone comes out and knows everything. But I mean, one thing that really stuck with me on that is that you, you, as long as you can work on a team, like you can accomplish like amazing things. And like, just because somebody doesn't have 10 or 15 years of experience doesn't mean that like, they aren't a very important part of the community. Um, so obviously, I can't, I can't really say like how everyone should grow in their careers or how um, the tricks that would work for everybody. But I mean, I can relate to my own experience, both from being a junior and hopefully growing into a senior. Everyone says I am, so I, I hope I am. Uh, and then, yeah, just try to draw a few lessons from that and then uh, get into the slides a bit more. So uh, that's generally the topic here is you belong in a room full of wizards. Um, the concept being, you know, you walk into a room and like everyone there seems like they know so much more than you could ever know. And as I've been within that community more and more and more and like kind of played the game myself, I've sort of learned like everyone's actually just kind of compensating and hoping nobody guesses that they don't know everything. And um, so anyway, I'm going to just kind of start back in the beginning about like the, the myth I've created around myself and like the myths that other people created around me for some random reason. So I mean, one of the most common myths like I have encountered, especially down in southern Utah for some reason, is that I grew up in a cave and was raised by wolves. That <laughs> is mostly false. Um, I was actually raised by humans, uh, but because my dad worked for the Park Service, uh, we traveled around a whole lot. So by the time I was probably like 12 years old, I had probably spent less than 20% of my life indoors, like at least at night. Um, so um, uh, I had very little exposure to electronics for the first part of my life. I mean, I had this flashlight I remember finding at uh, Big Bend National Park down in Texas. Uh, that I uh, had some like uh, corroded batteries in it. I took it out, cleaned it out in the river and all that. Kept that for probably four or five years, hoping I could like buy batteries someday and see if it worked. It didn't, unfortunately, but uh, the, the dream was worth it. <laughs> so um, yeah, and when we uh, finally uh, got a house and uh, settled down, we got this like set of encyclopedias from like uh, 1973 or something like that. Um, it was missing like R, so like I know basically nothing having to do with like things that start with R. But like, um, <laughs> but most of the other things, like I, I mean, I remember quite a bit from back then. And um, one thing I became really interested in was uh, amateur radio, or ham radio, whatever. Um, and it just seemed really cool to me the concept that like I could build something with like fairly few electronic parts and communicate with people like all the way around the world, but using a car battery or less power than that even. Uh, so by the time I was 13, I learned Morse code at about like, I don't know, 20 words a minute and read a lot about electronics and stuff in encyclopedias and a few things I could find in like a tiny library. It was like a bookmobile, like the bus would come and you could like tell them next week, like next week what you wanted them to bring you. And uh, so there was some cool stuff I found in there and um, finally found someone like up in, I guess, Green River that was giving the test one time, so I talked my parents into taking me there. They thought it was crazy, but um, 
but yeah, there's a whole bunch of like old guys, like World War II veterans and stuff, you know, and they're all like taking it, like giving the test. And uh, so yeah, we like do the Morse code and prove that we know how to like not kill people with like RF energy and stuff. And um, so, so yeah, so I got that and like for a while, like super cool, just threw these huge antennas across our yard and uh, it was, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy it still haven't got struck by lightning because I don't know how that was safe. But um, we, yeah, so it was kind of crazy because just with like a few watts of power and Morse code, like I could communicate with people in Japan. I think one of the first people I talked to was just like in Japan, then another one in like, uh, somewhere in Russia, I guess, uh, the Ukraine. And I was just like, yeah, this is so cool. I'm talking to these like crazy old people like across the world, you know? My parents were like, what are you doing? But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so, but I guess uh, the segue from that into what I'm talking about is uh, that's the, one of the first times I was exposed to concepts such as character encoding and, um, and like, so, I mean, both, both character encoding and then just like uh, concepts for like project planning and development and actually kind of ordering all the things you needed and putting it together and sort of like what we do with computers, but it was a bit crazier back then. Um, and at first I was a little like angry with computers. Like they're replacing all these things I think are really cool, you know, when I first like learned about them and found this like old, uh, old Commodore 64 in like this old abandoned like schoolhouse that was like in a neighboring city and like my friend and I took it back and got, got it working. We had like these three discs that would like play like some pretty cool games where you like hop horses over trees and stuff. Pretty much like the current uh, Google game where like if uh, Chrome doesn't give you internet you can just jump over a cactus with your dinosaur. But I thought that was fantastic back then and it kind of made me start learning basics so that I could like program my own little simple games that would like play on that uh, Commodore 64. But anyway, fast forward a tiny bit, I finally went to high school when I was like 16. And um, that was where I met a lot of other people that were into computers and learned some things from other people rather than just reading like largely encyclopedias. Uh, but <laughs> so um, that, that, that was a lot of fun. I was actually challenged to like do things like write AIs for tic-tac-toe and stuff like that. And we actually convinced the math teacher there to give us some credit on it, even though they didn't have a computer science course. So that, that was pretty cool. I uh, was like pretty much build a tic-tac-toe game that we can't beat and uh, you'll get a, a credit in high school. And I was like, yeah, I mean, tic-tac-toe, that can't be that hard, right? But like, uh, that was like, one of the first times I noticed, you know, like what your mind is doing is so much more complex than like what you can do on a computer. I mean, that's like some, if you write that with if statements, that's like 48 if statements. <laughs> but, you know, still that's like two pages of code, even in basic. So, yeah, I mean, you know, your go-to is only get up to like maybe 200. But, uh, so, um, anyway, um, yeah, I know Sarah Mace is like, don't talk about yourself. And like, I mean, I agree with her. She's probably wiser than me, but like, I don't know about you, I mean, other than what you've told me, I can't draw conclusions from that. So, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, in uh, uh, 2002, I started working on my uh, CS degree. And um, oftentimes, like, a teacher would explain assignments to me, and, like, he'd use new terms I didn't know, and uh, I would look around the class, and it would just seem like everybody got it somehow. And, like, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's easy, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. And then like I get to the end of that class and I'm like, how am I in like the top like 4% of this class? That like makes no sense to me. And you know, I just kept thinking like, oh man, I must have got lucky. I must have got one of the easy TAs to grade me or something. And uh, then uh, um, I, I just remember like, you know, I, I would go home and just like study all this stuff, trying to like make it make sense because I didn't think I got it. And it just kind of seemed like all these people that like seem for sure like they got it. Like, I don't know if they thought they got it or like if they, I mean, my guess is they were at this point in my life is that they were just kind of playing this game we all play where it's just like you can't admit that you're like, you don't know a concept, you know? Someone's like, oh, have you heard of this concept? You're like, oh yeah, sort of, I remember that. Yeah, yo, that was really cool. Yeah, t tell me what you like about it. But, um, you know, <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, a lot of this talk is just, I don't think that 
I don't think we should do that. I mean, we need to like actually just admit what we know and what we don't know and soak up as much knowledge as we can without pretending that we know it the entire time. Um, uh, one specific example I remember from, uh, from high school, or not high school, sorry, college, is this one guy would come into the class and for the first three or four assignments, he'd like pretty much make everybody feel bad because he'd do like 50, 50 times more than he needed to on a simple Hello World assignment. Let's, I mean, it was a bit more complex than that, but let's just start there. And uh, the teacher would be like, wow, this is fantastic. You should demo this to the class and everything. And we were just like, oh man, this guy is just like a genius. And then like after like three assignments, he just like couldn't finish his assignment because he just like over-engineered it like crazy. And like as it got more complex, it was like impossible. So we had like probably six times more code than we had, but like he dropped the class because like he couldn't get his assignment and it was like two weeks late. And uh, that happened again, like another class I was in with like the same guy and and like, I mean, I still actually respect that, I have a lot of respect for the guy and just like a lot of his code and the way he kind of thinks through something from the beginning, but I'm just like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you can't finish it. And um, that's, um, yeah, and that's where I get to my first point, like complete code will get you a lot further than my perfect code. And I mean, that isn't to say don't test it, I'm not trying to say it, but I mean, that being said, like, Testing is great, you should definitely test. You test because it makes the life of other developers around you easier. Um, your boss really doesn't care until like somebody else is working in the code and they come and say like, yeah, we can't even use this code. Um, then they care, but uh, at that point, presumably you're not there. So um, again, I'm not saying don't test. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, so like another thing that um, when I finally got a job in, uh, I guess uh, 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, well, I got one job first working for a radio station. Wasn't a coding job, but I wrote code because I wanted to and made their lives a bit easier. So I kind of could count that, I guess. But uh, anyway, 2004, I got my first real job. A friend of mine like was looking for someone so he could get like a hiring bonus, you know. And um, so he's like, oh, this guy's kind of good. So I got a Java job for like 2010, uh, for about uh, $10 an hour, which I thought was like epic. All my roommates were making like six fifty dollars from like Burger King or something. So like, uh, it, that, that was fantastic. And, um, but it was funny because I just remember going in there and being like, yeah, I mean, I'm a junior. I know basically nothing except for like a year and a half of college and a little bit of stuff I played with when I was a kid, you know? And like, they're just like, cool, do this project. I'm like, awesome, so how should I do that? Like, what should happen in this case? And then they would just kind of tell me something that didn't make sense. I'd be like, okay, sure, yeah, I guess I know what you're talking about, you know? And uh, I'd uh, walk away and just do it. And I mean, that brings me to like this point, like, don't be afraid to ask questions. Like, just, if you don't know something, ask the question. I mean, very rarely is that going to reflect poorly on you. Like, I mean, I guess in the case that you literally ask like, just something super bizarre, like, hey, what's this, what does puts do or something, you know? And like, when you have a Ruby job, like, I mean, I can't say like this is always not gonna come back on you, but like, in that case, honestly, still ask the question because you might wanna get another career at that point, but like, <laughs> and you wanna probably find that out as soon as possible. So, um, and then, so then, uh, uh, as a second point, like, as a senior, just do everything you can within your team to develop an environment where people aren't afraid to ask questions, where like somebody asks a question and you'll sit down and help them figure it out or tell them that you don't know either and let's figure it out together or these are some search terms I think will help us find this or whatever it is. I mean, don't, don't feel like you can't admit you don't know something. Um, and I mean, another problem, it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem now, but when I first started, there was just like huge culture. We didn't really have like junior, mid, senior so much back then. It was just kind of like, these are the gods that know everything and don't disturb them. And, and like, I think now we have more of a culture where like at least the people called senior like 
have more of an incentive to make the people around them also be senior rather than just like, I don't want you to be a senior, then I won't be smart anymore, you know? And like, that might have just been my perception back then, but like, it really seemed like you would ask a question and they would just come back at you, which is like, read the freaking manual. And um, that, yeah, there, there's my slide for that. Um, but um, really, I mean, sometimes you're asking a question and it's like a completely valid question. Like, so the way you set the server up, is it gonna be a problem if I'm uh, expecting a call on this port? And they're gonna be like, read the freaking manual, let me Google that for you, or some pointless, useless thing, you know? And it's like, yeah, sure, if I'm asking a really stupid question, I mean, you don't, still don't tell me it's stupid. I mean, maybe come and say like, you know, I think that this could help. And at that point, if it looks really simple, maybe I'll just know I was stupid. But like, there's no reason that you should ever point that out. Especially like, I mean, read, read the freaking manual and like, let me Google that for you. Honestly, it's probably worse because it's even more passive aggressive. But like, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that brings me to uh, my uh, first main point. Um, we're all faking it, but in the meantime, we, ac we accomplish great things. Um, that's what programmers do. And like my point with that is that as we learn to do and say the things that make the people around us think we know what we're talking about, we actually do know some of those things. We actually do learn some of those things. And as long as we can accomplish tasks, as long as we can walk home and feel good about like solving a problem that we didn't know how to solve at the beginning of the day, we're programmers. Also, I, w I didn't have time to like look up like which pictures I could like legally use, so I just used all my own pictures, so. Um, <laughs> just, <you know. laughs> um, so, with all that being said, I mean, if you're trying to make it in any community, become familiar with the common principles within that discipline. I mean, um, with, within Rails, like, we obviously, I mean, TDD, I guess, right? Um, so, it, TDD, TDD is an interesting one because from going to a conference, I mean, literally everybody walks around feeling like, wow, every single person in this room has 100% test coverage. But like, and I literally just, I, I must be like the biggest faker in this entire room because like my last project only had like 60% coverage. Um, and that like, I, I don't know, because like that was the point of like uh, DHH's talk, like TDD is dead. I mean, if you listen to that entire thing, he wasn't saying don't test. He wasn't even saying don't do test driven development. He was saying like, we've turned this thing into like a religion, like in the same way of like a random diet or a fad where it's just like, everyone must do this thing. Oh, you're on that diet? Well, no wonder you look like that. Um, and I think that it's, that isn't in any way helpful. I mean, like tests are there to give us confidence that our code will pass, that our code will continue to work in production, that when we make a small change to our code, it's not gonna break something on the other side of it. Like, that is the intention of tests. And I think a lot of this like kind of shaming people with like, oh, you don't do enough TDD, is just resulting in what Sandy Metz referred to as brittle tests, where everyone is just like, in order to get the test coverage, just go and test everything they can think of, and then like the things that are really hard, they're like, oh, well, I have enough test coverage and everything else. I guess these don't need tested. And you end up with tests like, oh, yeah, my user has many listings. Let's verify that that works, and that like when I validate that a name must be there, it actually is. And you're like, yeah, Rails is already testing that. You don't need to test that. So um, this isn't a te talk about testing. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, test, tests are great. Um, so, I, <laughs> again, uh, don't, don't use these principles to shame others who uh, maybe didn't memorize the acronyms as well as you. Um, help them understand how to make sense of them. Uh, like, a lot of times, I mean, like, everybody learned Rails because DHH made a 15-minute video that was like, look, I made a thing. And we were all impressed enough that we like dropped our system dot out dot print lines and went over and started working with this. And uh, and then like there became all these kind of topics within that like you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. But there's very little actually explaining how to do that or why to do that or how to know, know if you did it well. I mean, even to this day, like 
there isn't really an easy way to set up a test framework for Rails. I mean, sure, we have some scaffolding that sometimes passes like just on de by default, but usually it's like to set it up, write all this work, and you're just like, but my site works. I can see that my site works. Like, why do I need to test it? It's like, well, there's a lot of reasons you need to test it, but there's not, no one that really there, like, unless you're lucky enough to have a really good mentor or something, saying like, this is exactly how you do it. And yet you go to like a conference and it's still just, yeah. I mean, nobody's like, oh, shame on you. They're just like, that doesn't even need to be said. Um, so anyway, um, moving on. Uh, so, I mean, same with solid principles. I mean, how many interviews have you been to where they've been like, okay, like, can you explain what every point of solid stands for and exactly what this third one means to you? And, I mean, I've been told, like, in uh, code reviews, like, on open source projects and other things that, like, I have a firm grasp on solid principles, so I hope that that's the case. But, um, like, and I, I think, like, eight years ago, I memorized them for a couple interviews and um, tried to, like, make sure I actually applied them in my code. I even one time went through and kind of marked the areas I thought I needed to work on. I honestly don't remember what, like, all of those stand for anymore. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can shame me. Um, so, uh, yeah, moving on to uh, dry. That one's easy to remember. Just remember that one. Um, uh, I, I liked your wet one the other day, too, though. I mean, that, that made a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah, it, it's so easy to look at somebody's code. Like, somebody could walk up to you and be like, look at this really cool thing I wrote. And you don't know why they wrote it. You just know what they're trying to do. You don't know if they live coded it. But you could, somebody could easily look at that and be like, wow, well, that isn't dry enough. And, like, following this principle, I'd move this up here. And it's like, yeah, a good code should probably be dry. You can help clean it up, but you don't always have to just find a problem with somebody's code. You could easily find the things you like about the code and then find a way to make it easier for you to read if you're going to be working in it. Um, and I mean, there's nothing probably more rewarding than taking like a bunch of code that you know works and then cleaning it up in a way that it's way easier to work with in the future and that you can just call a method and it's now all tested, and it looks fantastic. So um, moving on. He, he, he was one at the time. Uh, I mean, I guess to myself, maybe. I think my phone now puts a copyright on things when I take them, so yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so that uh, brings me on to my point uh, with uh, working with others again. Um, so try to understand each other. Like, I mean, I see, I see some people that are just like so annoyed with like, I just keep interviewing these juniors and they just come in here and they think that like, I, like they're deserving of my time and like, I'm just so annoyed with like, I'm just trying to find a good programmer. I don't have to pay any money. And um, <laughs> then, and you know, to some to some extent, I understand like their, I, what they're, where they're coming from. Like, I mean, it's pretty easy to understand where they're coming from. Like, I mean, they need people to get stuff done. They have a budget to work with. Probably 10, 15 years ago, when they got into the market straight out of college, they weren't paid anything near what like people are getting paid right now. And like, but at the same time, that's what the market is. And then like, you know, as so like as a senior, you know, understand like, you know, these people changed their careers or they, you know, they went and spent a whole lot of time learning this new skill, trying to like actually do something they could feel passionate about. And, you know, any interaction you have with them could literally be the difference between them walking away and saying, I guess I'm just going to go back to like sanitation or something, wherever they came from. Probably vivant, but um, <laughs> um, but um, so so like my point here is like you know my my son is looking at this lizard and this lizard just thinks he's gonna eat him right but like um, he just thinks the lizard is super awesome and wants to be friends and uh, he doesn't understand why the lizard like jumps off and runs away and like the lizard like just didn't want to be eaten. And like, so I mean, he could be really offended and be like, why does the lizard hate me? Or the lizard could be like, why the heck did this monster like try to eat me? But none of those things happened. And so I guess just while interacting with each other, like trying to understand like 
why they did and said the things they did and try to figure out like what can I say to change that perspective. Uh, and uh, moving on. So what I, a thing I've oftentimes told my teams is that uh, what matters most on like a team is like what you can accomplish, what you do accomplish, and what people think you accomplish. Not actually sure which order those should be in. But um, I think why I think that those are important is because I, I've worked with people that like I know are doing 80% of the work on the team and I've seen like budgets get reduced and I've seen like it come down from management like oh we have to let that person go and I've been like but that guy's great like look at all this stuff he does and they're just like yeah I don't know people people look at him and they just don't think he's working and I'm just like I mean but he is <laughs> uh, and so you know and then you know there's people that just like you know, they work really, really hard, but they never get anything done because they don't understand the basic principles and they don't take the time in the beginning to learn those principles. So, like, I feel that, honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, I guess number three is probably most important, but, uh, <laughs> like, at least in keeping your job. <laughs> because, I mean, if you don't know and do things, eventually people will stop thinking that you know and do things. So, um... Uh, moving on. I don't know if that was me. I guess it was. Yeah, I don't seem to have a volume control. Thanks, Touch Bar. <laughs> um, so uh, that moves me on to my next point for uh, advancing your career or just, you know, something career. Um, uh, contribute to open source. Uh, that's been mentioned a couple times during this uh, conference in different contexts. But um, I feel like you know whether you get paid or not, and I also do agree that it definitely gets, it definitely sucks when you get a project to the point that all you have is a million issues asking you to fix bugs that you don't think are bugs. But, um, and you can't easily get burned out and possibly getting money on that would help. But regardless, like just in terms of like in advancing your own skills, getting recognition within the community, contributing to open source is a fantastic way to do at least both of those things. And uh, moving on, uh, so I mean, some of the biggest projects I've been part of in the last uh, few years, well, Peter Gate actually is one of my older projects, which is just a, a pretty much author, basically Rails uh, authorization, not to be confused with authentication. Uh, Alan doesn't like it. Um, just kidding. <laughs> um, and then Amber is a full featured uh, web framework uh, that, um, Honestly, I mean, I'd say it was better in Laravel, at least. It doesn't have everything Rails did, but it has probably everything Rails like 2.3 had, so. And WebSockets, too, so. Um, look at that if you feel like it. Uh, Crystal is an awesome language in that it's super fast and has a really cool community and looks a lot like Ruby. Uh, Exorcism was mentioned earlier. Uh, Exorcism is a really easy thing to get into, uh, both in terms of just doing the exercises and getting better, but also, it's one of the easiest things to actually get a pull request into because you can go and say, OK, I can do all of the Ruby ones, or maybe you're coming from another language. I can do a lot of these challenges. You could then take those same challenges over to a new language you're learning. After you do the ones that exist, say, well, here's 15 that exist in like C but don't exist in, this, in Ruby, or vice versa, or Elixir, or whatever. And you could actually say, I'm going to take that. I'm going to write the test framework for it and what the example code should be, make sure that follows the format from the contributors, learn about forking and upstreams and keeping all of those in sync, and contribute and actually get some pretty decent PRs that will probably be more useful to people than a lot of random other open source you could do. Uh, and I mean, uh, the exorcism team very much depends on people from the community to write these courses. So, uh, that's an excellent one to kind of get your feet in open source. Um, so that brings me on to my next point, do magic tricks. Um, and I, I think you can kind of take that two ways. Like, you know, I kind of just got done talking about how like everyone's just pretending. And um, that's, it's not necessarily bad. I mean, like if you're making other people feel bad, then it is. But like if you're just doing magic tricks so that like the same thing you're doing is interesting, whereas if you were just typing slowly, it would look boring, then like, by all means, like, do it. I mean, that's like, look at most of the people that give talks all over the place at all the circuits. I don't know, even know if they have to program anymore, but they're really good at pretending. So, um, 
Uh, and I mean, most of them actually are doing like really great programming. Uh, but like they're also really good at the presentation of that. Uh, and I, I like to think they enjoy it more because of that. So um, moving on. Uh, so uh, an Oscar Wilde quote was, the truth about the life of a man is not what he does, but the legend which he creates around himself. And I, I mean, some people have an issue with that because it's like basically like your perceptions more than what you actually are. But like, honestly, at the end of the day, like if somebody still thinks you accomplished all these things, you must have. So uh, I've kind of always loved that quote. Um, so uh, live coding is a performance art that uh, I personally like. And I mean, I've seen some really awesome live coding. I mean, I think I honestly got that from just like DHH is like build a blog in 15 minutes, like back in 2005. I was just like, this is amazing. Like he literally just types. He obviously didn't like edit this because there's all these mistakes and everything, but it's completely usable. And I can tell that like, it's not just one of those super polished like Pluralsight things where you're like, that's awesome. But I don't even know if you know these things you're saying, you know, you know? So uh, I feel like, like live coding, like it makes you like one of those people that like, uh, you know, like CSI Miami or whatever, like make stuff that don't actually exist. Where it's like, I can type really fast and do cool stuff. You know, like you get to pretend you're one of them, and that's <laughs> it's rewarding. So, um, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, uh, moving on. Uh, so uh, like. Uh, like any performance art, uh, it takes practice. But if done well, you'll gain the respect of both peers and potential employers. Uh, I mean, your potential employers just expect all programmers to do that anyway, right? So you might as well. The ones that aren't technical, I mean, which is kind of most of them. Um, so uh, in my opinion, Vim, but I mean, this honestly could be like kind of any editor that you're good at. I think uh, Vim like has the uh, advantage of like looking magic by default, if you like can do anything cool in it. Uh, it probably doesn't actually make you way faster, although there are a, co a few things that I like, I get into Facebook and I'm just like, what? But um, so, um, oh yeah, that, it might actually just make you so you can't use any other text editor. But uh, <laughs> st still, it'll look cool. So, uh, so just say, take that for what it is. Um, so then, I mean, uh, Tmox kind of along the same uh, vein, like, it's really, easy. it's really easy once you get used to it to move around and do things. You'll get carpal tunnel a little bit slower, maybe like, uh, and also you'll look magic because without ever touching a mouse or moving a mouse curse pointer, you'll be able to get from one place to another place, accomplish things, and people will just see magic happening on your screen. Uh, and you'll at the very least feel good about yourself and other people will tell you you must be smart. So. <laughs> Um, moving on, uh, emulate rock stars. Uh, DHH would say emulate drug dealers, I guess. But like, um, I obviously I'm not a race car driver, um, but I do. There are a lot of things like that DHH has done and said that like I try to emulate, such as live coding uh, and liking testing, but talking crap on it. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, don't use your magic tricks to make others feel inadequate. Uh, that one can be compl complex. Um, you might not always get it perfectly, but um, as long as I think you're honest about what you're doing and you don't come across as like, I literally know more than everybody else in this room, that you'll probably be fine. Um, how much time do I have left, Alan? Uh, five minutes. Oh man, better just go really fast then. Uh, okay, so <laughs> history is full of examples of oppressed becoming the oppressors. And uh, by, by this I mean like it's really easy to think of yourself as just, I'm this person trying to compete in this world that's just so hard to compete. And as you like learn things and get better, uh, it's hard to stop thinking of yourself as that. You might actually be the person at the top that's now putting everybody else down. And it's really easy to still think in terms of this is what I have to do to get ahead. And uh, I try to be really... Uh, careful about that like in my own career as like I get to a point where I actually have authority uh, not to still just feel like I need to prove that I am better than the people around me. And um, yeah, so the habits you form while building your career could easily be used to keep others down once you get into a position of authority. So 
be aware of that. Um, so on to teamwork. Um, so uh, as a team member, uh, a working project is more important uh, than contributions by individual rock stars. Um, moving on. Uh, how, however, when demoing team projects, it's best if team leads give credit to individual ideas and solutions uh, without like those people having to stand up and be like, hey, that was me. <laughs> you know? uh, so uh, uh, offering uh, deserved praise on others' work will get you a lot further than pointing out how smart you are or what you contributed. And uh, by that, I mean pretty much what I said, I guess. But um, like, you know, it's so, it's so frustrating when like, you see somebody else taking credit for your work, or you know I worked literally an entire week on this and didn't get any sleep, and somebody else is just like, look what the team did, cool, yeah. And, but at the same time, I mean, you stand up and say like, oh, hey, no, that was all me. You know, like, that doesn't in any way make you look good. Nobody's going to like, call you up after they go to a new job and say, hey, come work with me. Uh, but I mean, like, as long, they'll know if you did good work. Like, the people that matter on the team will know if you did good work. And if, I mean, that goes back to my previous point. Like, I mean, as a senior, take time to acknowledge that. But, like, if that isn't happening to you, oftentimes just standing up and pointing that out, like, which, I mean, I've been guilty of in the past, you know, like, it isn't going to make somebody say, like, wow, that person's smart. Look at all the things they think they do. So, um, whereas, like, I mean, if somebody in my life, even when I, walks around and says, wow, Isaac solved this problem in exactly this way, and it was so great. Like, I'm like, I don't even know, guys. I'm bashful now. But like, um, I feel good. I like that person, you know, because I feel like that person, for one, understood what I did, which makes me feel like maybe they understand programming better. And I'm happy because I'm happy when people are nice to me. And I'm way more likely to want to work with that person. Um, so. Uh, HDR. HDR is in photography where you take uh, multiple pictures of different exposures and use the dark parts from a picture where it would have been too bright and combine it with the bright spots from another picture where it would have been too dark, etc. Um, I feel like in teamwork, it's really important to find like where where you could do your best, like the parts that you could fill in better than anyone else, and. Uh, work with people on what they're skilled at and respect them for those skills. Um, and uh, if you're getting started, don't let the fear that everyone around you knows so much more keep you from trying. Uh, if you've ever programmed and want to do it professionally, then you are a programmer. Everyone in this room probably knows something you don't, and that's fine because you know things they don't. Um, there's more to know than anyone could ever understand, and in that way you're the same as the best programmers to ever live. The end. Thank you. Cool. Any questions? Since you've worked, gotten to work with a lot of junior devs, have you noticed a difference in, say, the attitude on the ones that do progress a little bit more than the others? Like the attitude they have when they're coming against problems or anything like that? I mean, I've definitely noticed a difference, but I've kind of seen people from all camps progress. I mean, I've worked with, I've worked some people that came in and they were just like super uh, uptight and like super afraid that like anything they didn't know would be held against them. And like, so the, and because of that, it would cause them to like argue like, oh, I'm right no matter what, even when they're just like so clearly weren't right. But in some cases, I've seen those people when they actually four or five times in a row see that like, the solution you came up with was actually better in a way that they could see, or you found a solution on the internet that proved it to them, or a video that said, like, this is how you should do it. Like, if you can do that in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're being attacked, some of those people have still become some of the best programmers I've worked with. I mean, obviously, the person who, like, is intelligent and yet, like, wants all the information they can and have no ego, like, I mean, obviously, I mean, that's kind of perfect situation, but, like, I've seen many other people excel. Like so. Um, so open source has been mentioned several times here as a great way for juniors to get started. And it looks like based on some of these survey results, there's a lot of juniors in this room. Um, one of the things I've noticed when talking to juniors, a lot of them have said to me, 
like, yeah, I've looked at open source projects, but it's way over my head, or I couldn't find anything that made sense that I could help with. Where would you suggest those juniors get started with open source that they can actually handle? Oh, that kind of goes back to my point about contributing it to exorcism, because like, in that case, you're actually looking at a pretty small uh, problem in some cases, and you know exactly what it is you're trying to do in that like, you already maybe solved five or six other problems, and now you want to give back. And I feel like that's like a very small, like, palatable thing that somebody could accomplish in anywhere from like 20 minutes to a couple hours and actually get the experience and a back and forth on a PR like, oh, that's great. Thanks for the contribution, but could you change this one thing and we'll accept it, you know? Uh, I, I mean, that's just one example. Uh, but I mean, I would say find a piece of software that isn't overly crazy that you use, but you want it to do something else. I mean, exorcism is just an example, so. Yes? I was just going to add to that. Oh. Another good place to start is documentation. Uh, popular things, documentation is always lacking. Like, I don't know if any of you are familiar with like, Ryan Big or Steve Klavnik. They did a lot on the Rails documentation early on. And I'd say they probably were at a point where they were super senior when they started doing that. Kind of trying to work their way in. That, that's a great point. I mean, documentation, like, nobody is ever going to be mad at you for making documentation. Like <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it requires you to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean if they if they if they if you put forward documentation and it doesn't even actually work or it can leads people wrong, I mean they're at least gonna say like, yeah, that isn't right. But uh, hopefully like people in the community are actually almost better at documentation because they understand the parts of the project that like we don't. Like they had to start from the beginning and set that up. Whereas like, if you've written a big project, you might actually be kind of bad at the documentation because there's so many things that you just take for granted. Like, well, obviously I start here. So, uh, yeah, is that it, or? Can you show us a magic trick? <laughs> like, I mean, I, I can show you Vim. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, one, one, thing, one thing that I feel is like super useful is hotkeys. I skipped over that one pretty fast, but I feel like just the ability to like never have to really touch your mouse and just like switch between like say your terminal, your browser, your editor, um, your Slack, wh whatever it is, right? Um, I feel like those things like both save you time and you probably won't have to get carpal tunnel quite as soon and make you look magic, so. Awesome, thank you.